Hey, my name is X, and I wanted to do a Kerbal Space Program video uh, attempting to, to mimic what SpaceX is going to do with their Mars missions instead of a hundred people going to uh, Duna, in this case, at a time, I'm only going to build in a requirement for 20 Kerbals. But as uh, many players know, um, sending uh, very large ships long distances requires insanely large boosters. Um, I wanted to do this mission in a kind of a medium size first, and who knows, um, if there's enough interest in the video, uh, I might do it again with a full-scale 100 Kerbal mission. Anyways, so we are also required per the SpaceX specs for their mission profile to reuse our booster uh, as many times as we need to to, to fuel up and uh, deliver, both deliver and fuel up our transport ship that's going to carry our people to a faraway land. Um, so as you'll see, that is what we do. We use the same booster uh, a few times to uh, k get it ready for, for uh, doing its uh, SOI change out to Duna. One of the things I did was build a, a relay system uh, for communicating with our ship as it leaves the Kerbin system. I'll do a video kind of showing exactly why I did this the way I did it later. And I also sent relays and scanners, uh, in, the, in the case of Duna, sent a relay that actually doubles as a scanner of the surface so that we could fulfill another requirement of their mission, which is to refuel ourselves on the distant world and return using that fuel. So we have that scanner orbiting in a bipolar orbit um, so that we can face outward and not be blocked by the planet very often. As we kind of figure out the best landing points, there are a few good candidates there. All right. I just created three different ships. One has the transport ship on top. Um, the other one is just a bo booster and then the refueler are all Perhaps I'll share these files with everyone later. Here we have our transport ship. As you can see, uh, quite a large booster. And you can imagine we might have to double or triple that size uh, just to, to carry more individuals. We're in sandbox mode, so right now I only have eight curveballs, but I'll bring them all for good measure. I'm not leaving anybody behind. Um, I don't know who's going to fly us there, but that's part of the reason we have the automated system built in, right? You can see the various um, parts I brought with me uh, for various reasons. We needed the port so we can refuel with our refueling ship. Uh, we need to, of course, fuel ourselves on the distant world, so we need to bring a small drill, a small ISRU, and the smallest or tank that we can possibly carry um, just to uh, make that a functional system. Then of course we've got lots of um, you know control, uh, reaction control wheels so that we can maneuver this thing in the upper atmosphere and uh, on the way up of course. We did use auto strutting for this because this large of a ship with all these pieces kind of stuck together would have required a lot of ugly struts strewn about the surface. And of course, real engineers at SpaceX wouldn't have um, these bars just hanging out everywhere. So I really love that new feature. Um, we did not try to imitate the exact engine configuration or number, but we did try to use a similar uh, type of engine. There's these smaller ones that we can just hook up. Have lots of thrust using only gimbal on some of them and then not even 100% gimbal just to give us some aid and control. Now I have opted for parachutes because I found that without the parachutes this thing was very difficult to land 
required a ton of extra fuel, really makes it impractical um, in some ways. Um, we also strengthened our struts a bit, so that our, our, our landing gear, excuse me, the, the springs on them. Off we go. So, these ships are actually still a little bit difficult to fly, so I'm using some assistance from MechJeb. As you'll see, I use MechJeb to automate a lot of things throughout these types of missions. Using manual control when necessary, and actually during this launch, um, does require a bit of manual control to just kind of push the thing in towards uh, the vector that you're looking for. As we get up into the upper atmosphere, we're of course going to separate. We're not, we're not uh, taking kind of a normal vector to get into orbit because we don't want this thing to be well on its way across the ocean before it has to try to turn around and come back. So th the booster stage is merely lifting us up to about 30,000 um, 30, meters. And then once we take off, the, the transport ship will use some of its fuel to uh, obviously get us into orbit. And then that's part of the reason why it needs to be refueled. And that's part of the, the SpaceX uh, kind of description of, of how that's supposed to work, too. After a few seconds, that booster's just a tiny dot down below. And then the trick here is to push, because we can't simultaneously control two ships um, that are have a physics applied to them. So what we need to do is switch between them. That means pushing the apoaps of this suborbital vector out for the transport ship considerably far um, so that you have enough time to work with your other ship and then come back. So I'm using a little bit of thrust just so that that can gimbal and get this turned around much faster. You see my Werner engines working uh, over time as well as the re reaction wheels. We just need to get pointed in the right direction, and then we kind of thrust all the way to 100%. And uh, we don't want to keep pushing uh, facing retrograde, because retrograde is suddenly going to change on us. And then, as I found out the hard way, it takes many, many attempts to get this part right. I recommend saving right before you do your uh, changing of, of ships, uh, as I did a moment ago. Because this part will be the part you need to reload many times, at least a few times. Well, once you get the hang of it and it's kind of a, a sequence of events you have to get exactly right, then you may not need uh, so many retries. I'm using stock visual enhancement and that sure does make this look nice. If I'm at Space Command right now looking up, I'm really hoping this goes well because that looks like it's going to flatten the VAB. It's just a giant brick falling from space. So I, I'm turning off my control surfaces on the way down because this is facing backwards and that kind of uh, screws up the, uh, the control of the vessel a bit, so it's always important to turn those off. I wish there was a good way to automate it, but I don't know of a way. Maybe somebody can leave me a tip. Here are both types of chutes. Uh, really help us get this thing under control and ready to land. Uh, a couple of times practicing this and you can get it to land exactly where you want it to. I wouldn't try to shoot for much closer to the, the launch pad than this because uh, then you're really risking a massive collision. And here we are, a nice landing. Now we switch to our other ship and let uh, whoever we left behind... Oh, wait, we didn't leave anybody behind. Uh, well, someone's going to pick that up and put it back on the launch pad. Hire some robots. Well, there's always the guys that are, like, hanging around in, in the VAB. Running back and forth, acting like they're working. This time, they're going to actually have to work. So... As you see, I just kind of fixed my orbit a bit so that it wasn't so, um, uh, you know, elliptical. 
in facing in a particular direction, you can kind of correct that. Then I use just my jab to say, all right, give me, give me a circular orbit at this point. Once you get the apple apps in front of you, then you can set that maneuver node. Of course, we've got six engines here. Um, got actually control group set up for uh, one of the sets of three so that we can turn those off when we don't need as much thrust. But as you'll see, most of the mission you do need, um, there's, a, there's a lot of times when you really do need uh, the six engines to kind of just make, make your burn not have to be so long. Even if the gravity doesn't necessarily necessitate it, I hate, absolutely hate, getting into a mission very far and then realizing uh, you have a very inconvenient amount of thrust. I'd rather have a little bit too much than too little. All right, so we've got our ship in position, and we're just getting it to where it can easily mate up with this other ship, the refueling ship, once we get up there. And we're off with our refueling ship. As you can see, it is the exact same booster configuration. We're pretending it is the exact same one, although it respawns and gets made anew again, of course, in a digital sense every time we, we re reload it. Um, but in the practical sense, we can say this was the one that we launched before. Um, it's important to keep your top sh ship, uh, your second stage of this, uh, similar to your transport ship. That way, you're not going to have any massive uh, difference in the way they control. Of course, we've got more fuel in this time, so I think the weight might be a little bit higher. And off we go. See ya. Come back to you in a minute. Now the refuel ship also has some uh, parachutes so that it too can return safely and be used again and again. This mission, the way it's configured, needs a third trip from this refueler in order to uh, get 100% full on the, on the transport ship. Tweaking it a little bit, you could probably get that down to two. Or just carry more curveballs. That might be the better thing to do, and to just try to get to the point where you can do a hundred. Yeah, so we've got this face in the right way also, and it should get ready to land here shortly. Same drill again, just, uh, you know, I really like the auto land feature in MechJab. That just makes certain things so much easier. I do a lot of repetitive tasks where I docking or retrieving vessels with uh, refineries and, and stuff like that. So I really learned that the time-saving methods uh, that you can get from MechJab are, are worth it, even if some people would call it cheating. I know how to do all this stuff on my own. I don't need MechJeb, but it makes it uh, the type of game I want to play. I don't want to sit here and have to do every maneuver myself. Plus, these are supposed to be like remotely controlled by computers. Um, once you add, uh, and all of these ships, I should I should say, do have um, you know remote control capability. Um, as you can see, there's no people, no curveballs riding this thing. We are controlling it strictly through uh, Elon Musk's laptop, right? He's sitting on his couch getting these people ready for space. Everybody else does the hard work and he sits back and plays some, like, you know, virtual reality version of of Kerbal Space Program, but it's actual reality. Well, and by the time they get to doing this, perhaps we'll actually have something like that where he can plug something into his brain and, you know, God forbid, uh, be able to control us from, with a slight time delay uh, out to uh, Mars, uh, sending you and your family off to another world, and um, Elon Musk is flying you from his couch. It's probably a pretty nice couch, though, so he should be comfortable. He should be fairly competent. He seems to know what he's talking about. 
at least in these matters. All right, so we got this uh, this uh, refuel ship just pushing it into orbit. Won't bore you with the details. Um, and we will f just watch it burn because it's a pretty cool looking ship. Very nice uh, visual mod, the stock visual enhancement mod um, that I've really fallen in love with recently. I think it's fair to say. Alright, so we set that as our target so we can rendezvous and you'll get to see just how successful that was. Of course, we're using automated docking as well. Really just makes, makes sense to do that. Now you'll see here in a moment, when I do my docking procedure, I am using the auto dock. Um, however, I like to swing my ship around so it's, it's uh, sort of aligned in a certain way. So I'll still use my WASD, um, usually just the Q and the E to get that roll. Um, you'll see I'm not, uh, the way MechJub wants to swing the ship around isn't necessarily the way I would want to swing the ship around. So I will hit, hit Q and E to get that going. All right, turn on our lights so we can see what we're doing. Get the other ship, which I thought was going to be faced the right way when I left it last. Actually facing the right way. Get all the breakable stuff out of the way, so just in case something bad happens. It's a good procedure, right? And as you can see, I'm, I'm using the Q and the E to get that just faced the way I wanted it to. And we let Metjeb just take care of the difficult parts. I should say the annoying parts. The parts that are, uh, you know, beneath us. Yeah, once you learn, you, you learn the maneuvers, you don't need to do them every time. Come on. Give me a break. So as you can see, we've used most of the fuel from just getting into orbit. So if, the, if we had saved a little bit more, we might not need, you know, a third or... Um, now I'm using the ability to stick these windows up so all of my uh, my empty tanks can stay up on the screen and then one by one I just fill them with the full tanks. Alright, so as I said earlier, this really requires three trips from the refueler. We're going to spare you having to watch all of that. Um, but we, we will watch this guy come back to the surface. Okay, we just undock and push away from our transport ship. Now they have like uh, fuel where they can run their heating equipment and stuff and wait for me to come back a couple more times. Now, you know, setting up your, um, your vector so that you, you break your or orbit and create a, a suborbital vector and, you know, have that facing and actually going to land at, uh, at or near the space center is is quite difficult. Um, you have to really just save right before you execute that maneuver node and uh, tweak it a few times before you get it. So that's that's what I did here. The landing guidance does have you know the ability to. I set the KSC pad as the target. But I didn't, you know, I'm not under any illusion that I'm going to land on it. And I'm not using the land at target in this situation. We're going to use the land somewhere when we get to the ground. Just so that um, there's a soft landing. But I'm going to, you know, just kind of do some guesswork to try to get close. So this ship does get a little bit warm on its way in, but not too warm. And uh, using a little bit of its fuel gives us the ability to kind of control that. Uh, again, you know, it could be tweaked a little bit. You could kind of configure that a bit differently and, and to where you don't have to use any fuel and, and you're just really coming home on fumes because that's you know that's all you need. The calculations say you only need this much fuel. I, like I said, 
bigger engines, and a little extra fuel goes a long way to make your space, Kerbal Space Program uh, time just that much more enjoyable because you're not failing all the time. You're not getting hours and hours into a mission realizing you forgot something. <laughs> you know, <laughs> bring a little bit of additional fuel because if you forget that you need to do a maneuver or that that maneuver really takes more Delta V than you thought, um, you know, and there's butt saving maneuvers that you might have to do. You never know what you're going to encounter in space. So hopefully Elon Musk and everybody are thinking about it the same way. Uh, let's build in a little extra stuff because uh, so far their missions haven't had uh, as massive consequences as some of like NASA's have. We're sending a group of uh, astronauts off to a you know destination like the moon or something. All right. So we're just setting our maneuver node to take us to Duna and then using Kerbal Alarm Clock to allow us to just speed right through this. Going back to the, uh, what do they call it? The, the, the place where you go to watch all this stuff. Yeah, this place. <laughs> uh. So here we are at our launch window ready to leave and uh, as you could see we had well we were first starting out with just three engines but I realized you know what that burn's going to be quite long if we don't use all six so we used all six you may have seen in in the last scene there tracking center that's what it's called tracking station even The relays that I have set up in the system so far do a pretty good job of always giving you a line of sight or a path to get your signal home, no matter where you are. It'd be pretty rare and infrequent uh, of a situation to not have a direct way uh, to get control of your ship. Okay. We're just kind of fine-tuning our approach here at this point. Once we get out of the Kerbin Systems SOI and start focusing on Duna, see what we kind of have to do to have a good approach here. And I love that feature to just say, all right, tweak my approach. I'm getting our ship ready to come home to Duna. It's a pretty nice looking ship. I've kind of uh, fallen for its aesthetics. Portable, it certainly looks like it could be reused and uh, sort of space shuttle-y because of the one part. It's sort of like a, a futuristic space shuttle in my mind. And hopefully, hopefully we can carry people to other worlds with it. Here we are coming into Duna's SOI and uh, really just tweaking our vector so that we know we can hit some atmosphere, but not a lot of atmosphere. Just enough to slow us down a bit and assist our engines in uh, braking. Because I brought a fair amount of fuel with me, um, I am actually going to use thrusters to, um, you know, actually bring us into orbit. Uh, and slow us down in the atmosphere. So, a little atmosphere braking, a little bit of engine braking, and it gets the job done. You could do that differently, of course, carrying a little bit, bit less fuel and uh, just doing 100% uh, atmospheric braking, but that really does uh, get tedious of over and over and over again hitting the atmosphere 6, 8, 10, 12 times to, to slow your ship down. I hate it. Um, so I have to say, brought a little bit of extra fuel to avoid having to do as much of that. That's one of my cool favorite scenes from recording this video is, uh, 
our ability now to to focus our camera on any part of the ship we want um, that gives us some cool interesting kind of uh, angles for for shooting uh, little sequences like that so we're getting our ship ready for atmospheric entry we are not actually landing just yet because we without you know without doing a lot of math you can't do like nasa and, and the, the other space programs where they you know sometimes just come straight in and and slow down in the atmosphere and do all of their engine braking in the atmosphere that is uh much more difficult to plan uh, more power to you if that's how you want to play the game but for me i want to slow down get into orbit and then plan a a descent from there um doesn't require as much engineering skill which i don't have so you can see just a little bit of engine really pulls that uh that vector line in and creates an orbit for us very easily once i saw how easy that was i realized you know what let's make sure we clear uh just keep those engines on because we need to clear ike and we can't have it inter interfering with with our operations here so might as well just create kind of a small small elliptical orbit still quite elliptical and then just come around and, and do some more engine braking here For these types of operations, only need the three engines. I like the outer engines for landing because then you get more control on the edge of, uh, in, in more more stability, I guess. At least I imagine it would. Um, you got all your your force being applied in the center of the ship, then, you know, it can maybe tip over easier. I don't know. take a quick look at the relay system how that's working and then actually take a look at the relay that we've got doing our scanning for us I realized um, because of the way that I set up this relay uh, we needed to actually switch over to it and and get the data again uh, for use on on our main ship there's a nice visual effect from the stock visual enhancement mod the kind of eclipse type of visual effect really looks cool and pretty much everything looks cool with this mod um, gotta say it's it's really breathed new life into the game that's always been my biggest complaint with Kerbal you know fun to play but if it could just look a bit nicer. All right. So now we're just going to really finalize our decision for where we're going to land. It's got to be a place that's fairly dark pink. Um, that way, there's a high likelihood that no matter where we land in that pink zone, we will have enough fuel to actually harvest. It just has to be over like 2% or whatever uh, the number is. So we've picked our target. It is that crater. And that should be fairly easy to get into. Uh, doesn't look terribly steep as long as we don't land on, on the slopes of it. Uh, should be fairly uh, easy to land there. Another cool visual sequence. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to make a smaller version, a shorter version of this video. For people that don't want to necessarily get all of the commentary, um, of which I'm probably not uh, the best person out there to be giving commentary anyways, and get those cool visual sequences that I put in here, uh, string all of those together, and then just make a short clip of uh, more cinematic type of uh, presentation. So look for that soon if, um, if I ever get around to doing it. So here we are actually doing an additional burn because, as, as we can see, our uh, 
basically our landing prediction was going to carry us off. We wanted to slow down a bit more. And then really just kind of guess. There's little dimples everywhere on the surface, but we're just going to take our best guess. And we've got a little extra fuel, so might as well hop off to a more flat area, as you'll see, actually. Uh, I'll spoil it for you. I did have to do... It's another one of those cool cinematic sequences. So, yep, first guess. Uh, it's a little bit slopey. We could probably just hang out here for a year or however long it was, but... In practice, you'd want to be at the top of the hill, so that's what we're going to shoot for. We're going to take off again and, and in search for, uh, you know, magically landing on the top of a hill, because that's really where we want to be if we're going to get maximum sun all day. We don't want the beginning or the end of the day to be blocking our solar panels so that we can't work producing fuel for our return trip. On the real mission, if you were doing this, that would be a, a fail-safe schedule, a, a point of no return. If you get past a certain date and you don't have X amount of fuel and you can't increase production, you're screwed. You don't make your launch window. So, you know, taking it kind of seriously, let, let's try to get to a point where it'd be relatively flat and we'd be good to go. Is this the one? Is this the one? Yep, that'll do. We stick our drill into the sand. And yes, there is ore here, and it's pulling it. Now, we've got some engineers on board, and... and they're all at least three stars, uh, being that, it, well, I guess it, they're all five stars, being that this is sandbox mode. So we do get that increased efficiency with our one drill. Now, you could do this with two, three, four drills, bigger drills. Um, but, you know, I really wanted to do it as compactly as possible. So you have, theoretically, a lot of time to produce your fuel. You don't need to bring a lot of equipment with you. All right, so this is where we pick up, and we actually have a full ship at this point. We've gone to the tracking station and just let time pass over and over again and coming back and checking to see how full it was. Um, and before before the launch window, I think, I, I don't know. I have to look at the number of days that actually passed. But we are ready to go home now, so we're turning our control surfaces back on. I've got some doing pitch, some doing yaw and roll, depending on where it is on the ship. And so now we're ready to go home. So we can just turn everything off and pull it in with our, our control groups. We have liftoff, we're going home. None of these, none of these guys wanted to stay, I don't understand. The ship was leaving and they didn't want to just kind of hang around in their space helmets and, and hop around on the Duna surface for years waiting for more people to show up. So they all went home. I don't know if that messes up the whole vision of the whole thing, but uh, realistically they would send out another ship and then you'd keep like taking resources from them and, and creating a little colony thingy doing your best to survive and hopefully creating a lot of cool stories for us back on Earth. All right, so fairly simple to get this thing back to orbit, um, but we did want to have the control surfaces just in case we needed uh, some kind of some atmospheric assistance. Probably should have known that Duna doesn't really need much of that. But again, you know, you over-engineer so that you're not caught by surprise uh, not having enough.
because you might have an unexpected maneuver you might have to do. All right, so we've got some fuel consumed, obviously getting up here quite a bit of it, but we are also more, you know, more have more than we need to get home. So we just get everything situated so we can set our maneuver node, get ourselves into a nice, uh, even orbit. I, I like circular orbits. I like being a little more anal about that. Um, using MechJab to just say, all right, give us an inclination of zero. That way when we leave the SOI of this planet, hopefully it will be uh, nice and clean. There won't need to be a, a ton of uh, extra maneuvers. Another cool sequence. All right, pretty cool looking ship. She did her job and it's time for her to come home. Okay, here we are. This is the SOI change for our ship to come home. As we do another cool camera sequence. Sequence. Again, taking advantage of the new uh, aim camera feature to get some cooler camera angles for our recording here. And we're just going to go ahead and do a little arrow breaking on our way back. Um, of course, the, the back end of our ship is more suited for atmospheric re-entry than the front. With those, you know, typically engines don't uh, explode in re-entry if you can control your speed and your angle of descent. And in this case, we are having a little bit of problem with heat, but it's not getting out of hand watching it closely and as uh, some of those indicators start to go t a little bit too red I'm giving it a little bit of thrust to just help out with that um, you probably could engineer some sort of a heat shield for this type of a ship but I, th I felt that that was going to be way too difficult for what I wanted to do and typically coming back into Kerbin's atmosphere as opposed to say Eve's you don't have a terrible problem with heat uh, typically if you're careful
And then of course a little bit of thrust while you're at that periapse point in the atmosphere or near the periapse um, really does help you pull in the size of your, uh, the diameter of your orbit so that you don't need to do say 10 or 12 different, um, I might be exaggerating, but you know, many different rounds of aero braking can get very boring and tedious. So if you have a little bit of fuel to use, use it. Over engineer, that way, you know, this isn't reality. You're having fun, you're trying to do cool missions, but you're primarily trying to have fun and not waste hours and hours of your time doing tedious maneuvers. All right, so our ship is getting into orbit and ready to come home. It's gotta feel great when you've been to another world without the, the hospitality of Earth and the safety of Earth to come back and see that big giant blue marble knowing that all of the life-giving resources that you've so craved on on Duna or, or Mars are just down there waiting for you. All you have to do is safely get through the atmosphere and land without exploding. And remembering this is Kerbal Space Program so there's a very good chance you're going to explode. Alright, so I engineered that craft not to actually land but to come back to orbit and be used again in the similar fashion um, as it, it was first loaded up. So we are using one of my KRVs, my Kerbal return vehicles. This is an KRV LKO for low curb in orbit, 8K. We'll pull back eight Kerbals from low curb, curb in orbit. And I suppose I probably should have created one for 20 Kerbals, um, which I could do if I actually physically had 20 Kerbals to use on my mission. Um, but in this case, I hope you'll forgive the fact that I did not have 20 Kerbals in my, um, <clears throat> in my sandbox game save. But if we did, I would just engineer this a little bit bigger. Simply just get to orbit. No fuss, just get to orbit, grab some curveballs, and go home. Some pretty cool visuals as we do so. Alright, and as we speed up and do all of our maneuvers that you've seen a thousand times in your life, now we're about ready to dock with our ship got to be a sight for sore eyes that return vehicle coming in as they're all have their faces plastered to the windows again just use mechjeb auto dock to get this done easily and quickly of course this is an automated ship as well so it should know how to dock on its own you would think otherwise why not send an extra soul to do the driving. Oh, look at that. That's nice. Alright, so now at this point, all we need to do is transfer our curveballs from each of the capsules over. And I believe I recorded actually showing that I did four, but trust me, I did all eight. Did not leave any poor souls in locate LKO to rot for eternity until somebody else came and got them. Uh, we did bring them back all eight. Quite a successful mission if you consider that we went to another planet and survived there for well over a year, and then brought them all the way back, did atmospheric reentry to, to uh, slow the vehicle, and then obviously we're going to do another reentry just to break our orbital velocity and uh, get us to the surface. And of course, um, you could practice this many times so that you get the landing trajectory, trajectory exactly right and you land very close to the Kerbal Space Center. However, I think it, and on this occasion I just I was satisfied with getting reasonably close. That mountain range that you can see over the horizon, that's really the key. 
Get past the mountains. Don't leave your guys stranded on a mountain. Get to the, you know, slightly uh, more hospitable landscape. And I call that success most of the time. However, as you recall, I wanted my, my boosters. And the first part of this mission in the um, you know, initiation of getting all of our stuff into orbit and slowing it down, uh, uh, excuse me, not slowing it down, and re refueling it, uh, we did opt for landing on the flattest surfaces of the light green uh, biome right around KSC. So as you see here, I, I spun around real quick because I could tell I wasn't quite going to make um, the, the area that I was hoping for. So I uh, took a slight risk and turned around, risking overheating some of my parts uh, just to give it a little bit of thrust in the right direction, hopefully carry us a little bit further past those mountains, get us into kind of friendly territory here. And here we are, coming into land. Well, I want to thank everyone for watching. Um, this has been my very first YouTube video that's used a voiceover. So I appreciate all of the support. If you like the video, please like it by clicking on the like button. Share it with others. And it will inspire me to do more videos in the future. Here we are, landing and using our parachutes again. Such a good idea to use parachutes. I don't know why SpaceX isn't planning to use them. I suspect that when they actually go to full scale and start testing some of these devices, they're going to realize the importance of slowing down prior to using uh, any thrust for your final uh, landing. Of course, so we did not really add landing legs to this, but we're going to be such, it's going to be such a gentle landing that we shouldn't have to worry about it. Oh, little explosion. I think that's a light busting off. Yep. Uh, nothing to worry about. Everybody survived and we are home. Thank you very much.